A few years ago, we created an ambassador program at Sweet Georgia and brought together 10 amazing multi craftual makers and knitters and designers to help share our Sweet Georgia story. And at the same time, we wanted to help share the word about these incredible creative people and tell their stories and what they make and how they do it and specifically how they find time to do all their creative work. So today, I'm very excited to share this conversation with Athena Chang with you. She is a local Vancouver-based knitter weaver aspiring fashion designer who currently works as a software engineer we're very excited to support athena as a sweet georgia ambassador because she was so enthusiastic about working to become a knitwear designer so you may know that she designed the boba hat for sweet georgia which is a color work hat featuring the pearls from our favorite bubble tea drink so with that we welcome athena thank you so much for being here today it's really nice to see you Thank you so much, Felicia, for having me. It's such a pleasure to be talking to you on, on this uh, platform. And I've been watching you all these years. Um, I listened to your podcasts when there wasn't a, a YouTube channel before. So it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to knitting and crafts and all of this kind of stuff in general. Yeah, so I grew up in Taiwan and I moved to Canada when I was 12. But when I was growing up in Taiwan, I remember that I love to make all the kind all things. Um, and I remember very early on as a kid, my mom uh, taught me how to do origami. And so we would spend a lot of time like folding paper cranes and um, making little um, animals and all that. Um, so I think my first um, uh, intro to crafting is through paper crafts um, and I also loved uh, working with cardboard and just cutting out papers so I remember as a kid I would make myself like uh, cardboard uh, high heels because I really wanted a pair of high heels and my mom wouldn't buy me one because obviously I'm a kid <laughs> um, but I would make myself a pair of high heels with cardboard uh, and, and put on the straps and all that and decorate it and it was really fun but then when I put on the high heels uh, my my feet crushed the heel part and I was really upset about it but it was really fun yeah um, and I, I think throughout the years, I've learned that I really like making uh, garments specifically. Um, and so I had these dolls growing up and I would make clothes for them out of paper or out of whatever scraps of fabric I could find. Um, and when we moved to Canada, I went to high school here. And that's when I first learned how to sew on a sewing machine. Um, and that really changed my world because now I can make things that I'm, I can actually wear myself and uh, things that are actually durable. <laughs> um, and I learned to uh, draft patterns that fit my body um, because uh, one of the other reasons why I really enjoy making clothes for myself is that for me, it's really hard to find um, uh, store-bought clothes that fit me. Um, I'm a relatively small person, um, relatively flat-chested, and so even the smallest size sometimes um, is too big on me. Um, and so with these sewing skills, I could alter the things that I have to fit me better, um, hem my pants to fit my legs better, um, or it's just in general, create whatever um, dress or clothing I want or envision. Um, and I, I went down a huge rabbit hole um, into sewing um, in high school. Um, in high school was also when I met my friend Charlotte, who works at Sweet Georgia. Um, and I remember when I met her, she was uh, just sitting by the lockers, um, crocheting a flower. And I was like, wow, what are you doing? <laughs> this is so cool. Can you teach me how to do it? Um, and that's how we became friends. And I learned to crochet through Charlotte. Um, and she and I started a crochet club in high school. Um, and, uh, and it's funny because uh, later on when Charlotte learned to knit, I started to learn to knit too. So I get a lot of ins inspiration from Charlotte as to what kind of crafts to try. That's um, amazing. I, I I always knew that you guys were friends. I just didn't know what the connection was. I didn't know where you yeah, met. Yeah. I didn't realize that 
like she taught you how to crochet and then you both kind of learned to knit at the same time like yeah. that's that's so cool yeah <laughs> yeah and when she learned to weave I think that inspired me to weave as well so yeah she she's a great friend and uh, she's just really creative and she has such a enthusiastic approach to crafting and that is very contagious <laughs> and we used to have these craft afternoons where we go to her house and work on things together either uh, working on, on our own thing or we would share a sewing machine and try to make something together um, and she would make bubble tea for us and it's just really fun that's amazing that's kind of what she does here at the studio too <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> There's bubble tea days here and people sewing and making things here today too. And yeah, I think that like hearing about your background, I think um, there's got to be a lot of people who find um, a lot of similarities as well. You know, learning how to sew uh, your own clothes in high school is a thing that I think we used to be able to do. I don't know if people still get that opportunity to to have a sewing class to learn how to make things, but I know that we we learned how to make shorts in yeah, our high school as well. Yeah, yeah little boxer yeah. shorts. Yes, but I think it's also not really a far um, far like not very much of a big step going from paper to then going to fabric right? Yeah, because yeah. you're working with another flat kind of material yeah. and then constructing things out of a flat material, but then now going from that, that I, I also had the similar thing, like learning how to sew, making clothes, and then really getting into knitting. Um, and also having this understanding between like making the fabric that then you use for construction of making garments and things like that. So it sounds like you had a very similar path as well. Um, and so it sounds like you learned to knit relatively recently then. Yeah, I, I started to knit, uh, I think, six years ago. Um, it hasn't been super long, but um, I've also kind of developed my knitting skills throughout these years. So I guess I'm a, more of an intermediate uh, knitter right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. And so I see that you're also working on some other crafts you're yes. also doing what else are you working on because <laughs> it's not just knitting or crochet and sewing but there's yeah. more yeah absolutely so I I feel like I've always been a garment maker I love making things that I can wear things that are practical um recently though I realized that um I kind of want to challenge myself uh, to make things that are quote unquote, not practical, um, things that um, for maybe decoration or things purely for experimentation. Um, I, I feel like I don't give myself enough opportunity to do that. And so um, recently I've been diving into punch needle. I um, signed up for uh, one of the workshops at Knit City this year to learn um, punch needle from Sam, uh, who uh, had a class on the School of Sweet Georgia. And that's where I learned about punch needle for the first time. And I thought that it was such a beautiful craft, like the way that the stitches show up on um, this piece of fabric where you punch the, the yarn through. Um, and there are so many different textures that you can make. Um, and it just looks so beautiful. I, I want, really wanted to try it. Um, so that's why I started going down that rabbit hole. Um, and just a couple of months ago too, I uh, taught myself to quilt. Um, it seems like um, something that I probably should have tried um, a long time ago since I've been sewing for a while, but it just never happened until now. Um, and with quilting, um, I really enjoyed um, the precision it needs to um, line up all the pieces together um, and all the different geometric shapes that you can put together. And I find that at my workplace, um, there are a lot of software engineers who are into quilting. Um, and I, I wonder if it's because of the, the geometric part of it or the mathematical precision kind of thing part of it, but it's been really enjoyable to learn how to quilt. I know quilting is amazing. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole other rabbit hole and it's so much fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I've been, yeah. I've been looking at your Instagram and seeing some of those quilting photos. And um, I remember making baby quilts for the kids when they were younger. Um, oh it, yeah. It is a really, really fun way to, 
construct your own fabric from pieces and then it's color it's um, patterns it's creating geometric designs yeah there's so much about that that's really fun yeah and I think what's surprising uh, to me is that the the piecing together part doesn't take that much time but the actual quilting part where you sandwich all the layers together and sew through all the layers um the, the actual quilting part is taking me a really long time. And that's what I'm still kind of in the process of doing. Um, I thought it was just going to be done in like um, a, a week or two, but it's been like a couple of months now. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think, yeah, I think it'll be fun once I finish that. And I'm also, yeah, making a, a baby quilt um, just to try it out first and see if I like it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, with doing all of these different crafts and you're, you knit and then you also crochet, you also weave, you also sew, you also quilt, you also punch needle now. Yeah. Do you ever feel like um, some people feel guilty about like spending more time doing one thing versus another thing? Do you ever feel compelled like you need to just do one thing or stick to one thing? Um, what, what's your experience been about that? Like the feeling part of that? Yeah, I feel like I'm somebody who needs to be doing multiple things. Um, I I feel so much like myself when I'm deep into learning a new craft. Um, mm -hmm. And that feeling of excitement can sometimes get lost if I focus on one craft for too long. Mm -hmm. And then there's this critical voice that comes in. The more that I know a craft, um, and it te it's telling me that, oh, you should... Um, do this better than last time or like it some this needs to be done at a certain level of quality since you've been doing it for so long mm -hmm. and that pressure um that that critical voice can be kind of overwhelming sometimes um and then what i find helpful is to switch to a different craft and take a break from whatever it is that i was focusing on and create these opportunities for me to um be a beginner again at something and explore and experiment um, and just come in with a, uh, a fresh mind um, into a craft and really like hold on to that feeling of excitement for making crafts. Um, it shouldn't be a stressful thing. I don't want it to be a stressful thing. So I'm now more intentional with um, spending my time on crafts that actually spark joy <laughs> to me. Um, so that that's that's why I feel like I need to do multiple crafts at the same time. That's a huge that's a huge insight. I I think like into where the joy comes from for you for making things. Like the joy is in exploration and the joy is in experimenting. The joy is in following curiosity yes. and um, trying things that are new and being sort of surprised by oh like look at this thing that I can make oh look this is what happens oh and like all of those sparks of joy those sparks of um of yeah it's like an awakening to new things I feel like that's very different like you said from going down further and further into this path where you feel like you're obligated to show increased ability increased yes. skill like increased yeah. professionalism in some yeah. ways and like, like I, I don't know for you and for me like I'm not a production weaver I'm not weaving anything to for production so the weaving that I'm doing is for fun I'm learning and following curiosity and enjoying that for fun it's not necessarily about like creating something that then you can present to someone else all yes. of this making is for yourself right it's for yeah. fun yeah it is yeah. And, and the funny thing is I feel like sometimes this pressure is coming from myself and like you said to to show that you're making progress in a craft um, and uh, it doesn't really need to be that way mm -hmm. um, and sometimes switching to a different craft can help with that feeling I feel mm -hmm. like yeah mm -hmm. I feel like it's probably also been good because you have this um, fiber friend like Charlotte, right? Mm -hmm. Who was also curious and also learning new things. And you kind of um, inspire each other to learn new things, like you said. Um, do you find that like when you make things, when you craft things, are you 
enjoying that as a solo activity or is it for you more of a social activity? Um, how does that sort of work for you? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. Um, the solo part I really enjoy because I've always used my craft time, especially knitting time to kind of process my thoughts on things and, and process my uh, my day and like how it's been and, and to kind of talk to myself internally. Mm-hmm. Um, with uh, crafting uh, as a group though, I feel like that um, pushes me to try things that I would otherwise never try on my own. Um, and so uh, recently at my workplace, um, there are these classes that are hosted by the um, employees um, for other employees to attend. And, and some of these classes are things I've never tried, like uh, making collages, um, uh, painting. I don't, I haven't done that since high school. Like I'm just like, I don't even know how to hold a brush anymore. And I kind of um, figure like, well, you know, I want to put myself into that beginner state again and try something new. And I find that when you're in a um, a group, um, it's much easier to do that, um, at least for me. And then um, uh, the people in the group can share um, our progresses with each other. And it's like a, such a nice feeling to be learning alongside other people. Um, and I feel the same with the punch needle class uh, at Miss City too. Uh, that's something I, I don't think I would have ever done on my own um, and buy materials on my own to try out. But with a group, it just seems, it feels easier to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to do it with other people. I, I totally yeah. agree. And I, yeah. yeah, I see that you've been doing it. I see Leah's been doing punch needle and yes. I just, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I want <it. laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things, obviously, like you do a lot of different crafts, you're making a lot of different things. Everyone is always very concerned about this idea of time, not having enough time, managing your time, taking time to make things. And I know that like you mentioned about making baby quilts and things like that, you recently started a family as well. So how has all of this changed your approach to your crafting time? Um, how do you manage to find time to do all the different crafts and to manage all of your other roles and responsibilities in your life now? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, um, I recently became a new parent last year um, during the pandemic. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. You. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I feel like this past year has been... Um, the one moment in my life where my uh, relationship with craft has changed dramatically. Um, so in those first couple of months after I had the, the baby, I was experiencing um, a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of things changing. My baby is changing every single day. Um, and there's not a lot of time at all to, to myself to do knitting or whatever it is that I do, but I still try to squeeze out a bit of time uh, for myself to work on some knitting. Um, but even then, I feel like um, when I used to use knitting as kind of a way to uh, do self-care, I, I find that knitting alone wasn't doing it for me at the time. And I was still feeling like, ah, <laughs> like everything is falling apart. Um, and uh, I think I made it a bit worse when I forced myself to knit because um, people talk about um, how important self-care is uh, postpartum and I thought you know knitting is my self-care I need to do it more um, but deep down like I really wasn't in the right mindset to be knitting um, and also at the same time my body has been changing every week um, it went from like like a big belly and slowly like shifting around and uh, well like my my whole rib cage has expanded since um, having a baby. My arm has gotten thicker. Um, and so as, a, as somebody who uh, enjoys making garments, it's really difficult to figure out, like, is this the body that I will have going forward? Is it going to change? How should I be making my clothes to fit me? Mm-hmm. And so that was a lot <laughs> going on. Um, and on top of that, um, 
most of my old clothes um, don't fit me anymore. And I have a lot of um, handmade clothes that don't fit anymore. And I was really sad about it. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I wasn't sure how to deal with that. Um, and, uh, and I also felt the pressure to uh, make things for my daughter because uh, I don't know, going going into becoming a parent, people tell me like, oh, you should be like making like baby hats and baby socks and things like that. And they're so tiny, they won't take too long to make. Um, but I personally, I find that when I when I did that, um, I didn't get the, um, the same f- fulfillment from it um, compared to making something for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like when I was knitting something for my daughter, I was still in this parent mode um, and I wasn't able to get the kind of self-care that I needed time actually for myself uh, making something for myself and all all this added up (laughs) into a bit of a postpartum anxiety depression um, for a year Mm -hmm. um, where I realized that um, I was being really hard on myself and I was trying to um, tell myself that I need to make things that um, is supposed to flatter my body and I didn't know how to do it, but I was forcing myself to do it anyway and trying all sorts of different things to make myself do self-care even though I didn't want to. Um, And at some point I realized that I had lost the passion to make things. Um, And that was probably the first time I had felt that um, my whole life. Um, and that was just so scary because um, being a maker is a, such a big part of my identity. And, and I was at the point where like, I, I see my knitting needles lying there, lots of different projects, and I have no interest in any of them. Um, and uh, through uh, therapy and uh, lots of help from other people, I realized that um, at this point in time, I, I needed to slow down in my making and not force myself to make things if I don't want to. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a big lesson learned. Um, and I think it was a much needed lesson um, for me because there was just so much going on in this previous year that it's, it's okay as a maker to slow down or just pause pause your making for a little bit it doesn't make you not a maker but I do feel like there is some sort of pressure on makers to be like I'm always always making something like I'm making this I'm making that and people will ask you like oh what are you working on next um I don't know (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah I feel like there's kind of a pressure on makers to be making things and so um my approach now is I try to only craft when I feel like it, but I don't force it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've sort of uh, found ways to enjoy making without actually making things. So one of the things that I started doing a lot more is uh, appreciating my handmade clothes. So I make an effort to try to wear things that I made before that still fit <laughs> um, and and really just look at the texture of it, try to like um, look at the colors and see how to um, pair it with my outfit. Um, and um, I've also found some clothes that I really love, but that don't fit anymore. Um, and so I uh, try to find ways to fix it, to, to fit my new body. So I had this uh, dress where um, that I made right before I got pregnant. Um, and uh, now the armhole is too tight on me. Um, so one, one day I just decided to, um, I'm gonna take out my sewing machine. I'm just gonna fix the armhole. I'm just make it a little bit bigger. And, uh, and that took like maybe two hours or so. Um, and what I ended up with was a new dress that that fit me and it was Mm -hmm. just so fulfilling to be able to mend something that you have um it doesn't have like have to be like a huge project like making a dress from scratch um if I have a dress that's made already it doesn't quite fit right um I find ways to mend it and I think 
that is really enjoyable for me um, at this point in my life where I don't have four or five hours to make a whole dress, but I can spend one or two hours to make something fit me better. Yeah. I think yeah. you've said so many very, very important things in there. Like the, the the idea of being a maker and coming out at the other end with the finished objects and like having things that you made, so many things that you made. Um, and like you said, not necessarily having to make a whole brand new dress from scratch, but the fact that you applied your hands to something to change something. So that way you can enjoy something that you have made is so important. And it wasn't, it's not as onerous as having to start anything from scratch or have some output at the end of the day, but you have made something that you enjoy now and that you can still continue to wear and you can still continue to appreciate. Um, I think the other important thing that you said uh, is that like when you're going through those massive life changes and life stages, and it's just, it overhauls your whole life. And I think whether you have kids or don't have kids or have family or don't have family. Like there's a lot of um, responsibilities and things that we have to go through, lots of life changes that we have to go through where you may not feel like making anything. Yeah. Um, and that should be okay. And I think that maybe because we label ourselves as makers, we feel compelled, like we have to have output. We have to have made something. And then it's very frustrating because I went through exactly the same feeling. Like, what does it mean if I'm a maker, but I haven't made anything or I don't even feel like making anything? What does that mean? Am I still myself or am I a different person now? Or um, am I no longer a maker? And um, I think that when we get too locked into that label or the identity, then we're losing the parts of it that made it joyful for us in the first place so that's why like when I see you playing with the punch needle and playing with the quilting like it gives you that opportunity to not have to worry about things that fit your body but it gives you that opportunity to look at the color of the stitches look at the shape and the texture of the stitches like like this is fun this is this is something um, that you can pick up and do for two minutes at a time if you needed to and still really derive a lot of joy out of looking at what you're making as opposed to being concerned about this final output yeah yeah Yeah, final product yeah yeah it's a change in mindset I guess right it is yeah and I think one other way I found to be a maker but not making things is to watch other people make things Um, So I've been uh, following this YouTube channel um, uh, called uh, uh, Bernadette Vanner. Um, She's a dress historian and she reconstructs um, period clothing um, using a vintage uh, sewing machine. And she just shows all the different steps in how she constructs her clothing. And I just find it so fascinating to just watch people make things. And I feel like that in that way, I can still feel kind of connected to crafting, to making, but I don't have to make anything myself. Um, I don't know if you've also had that experience of watching other people make things. Well, I mean, I can understand that sort of uh, point of view for sure. Like I think about people who watch other people play video games, yes. right? <laughs> like you're not playing the video game, but you're you know enough about the video game that you know what's going on when you watch someone else play the video game. And so that part makes it still enjoyable because (laughs) like you're connected, you know what's going on, but you don't doing it, but you see people do Like I can understand that point of view. I can understand watching people make things. It's kind of like watching people cook too. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. And when you watch people do things, you learn a thing or two that you don't know before. And maybe you save it in your brain for trying out later. Like, I'm going to try this new sewing technique later. Um, Not now, but it's something that I might want to explore later and just uh, keep it in the back of your mind kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, like this past year, I started learning how to work with knitting machines. And this whole thing is very foreign. Yeah. It's very different, like holding the tools for machine knitting are different than holding knitting needles. Mm -hmm. Um, And so like watching other people 
work with a knitting machine and work with these tools and watching how graceful their hands are, watching their hand movements, like what does it look like? I found all of that actually quite fascinating, learning a lot without actually doing it. Just yeah. learning by osmosis, right? Observing and trying to absorb their motions. So that way, when I go to do it, I can hopefully mimic those motions later on. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And I, I also love watching you watch other people make things or learn new things like the knitting machines. Um, I've never seen a knitting machine in real life. And so it's just fascinating to me how like you set it up and how you get it going and things like that. Well, you got to come to the studio. because okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would love yeah. to. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to ask you about your designing because you had like, um, a couple of years ago, you had really wanted to go down this path of learning how to design and publishing yeah. knitwear designs and things like that. And how has that been going for you? Because I found what the most interesting thing was, it's one of the things that you talked about, where you went to the school of Sweet Georgia, and you learned how to knit color work. And then you came out of it at the other end, and then you designed a color work hat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It was like the first time you had done color work, but you're like, oh, it's okay. Now I can design a color work hat, which I thought was amazing. It was great. It was like very, it was very confident and um, just um, like you owned your skill, you owned your knowledge. And I was really excited to see that. So how has all of that been um, going for you these days? Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, designing the, the boba hat. Um, uh, prior to the boba hat, I had actually tried um, publishing a design on my own uh, of a, a cowl called the Yuzu cowl. And that was my first try into uh, pattern designing for uh, knitwear. Um, and how that came about was uh, I, I think I was watching some of the videos on the School of Sweet Georgia. And um, there was like, um, maybe I think there was a course on writing patterns or but something related to that and it sparked my curiosity about pattern writing and um, and I realized that it kind of reminds me of coding uh, as a software engineer um, because there are all these instructions that you tell people to do and you have to be very specific about what you want them to do um, and there are these sections uh, these roles that you tell people that like, you have to repeat them like this many times and it's very similar to coding where we have these things called for loops where you tell the machine the program to do this thing multiple times um, I just find that really interesting and I wanted to know how the pattern writing process works um, from draft writing a draft pattern to uh, finding test knitters to try out for you because even if you think that the instructions are clear it might not be to other people um, and I have never done test knitting before um, before um, writing my pattern and so I myself had wanted to try being a test knitter before uh, trying to find test knitters for my pattern so I signed up for um, to be a test knitter for uh, somebody else's design and kind of learn through the process of like how this whole thing works. Like how do you um, send uh, pattern drafts to people? How do you um, make sure like all the feedback is collected, that kind of thing. Uh, and then I went on and did that for myself. Um, when I uh, designed the boba hat, um, I, I found a couple of test knitters just by reaching out to people um, and, and trying to set up my own process for mm -hmm. working with them. Um, and so through um, my experience with uh, designing the Yuzu cowl, it made it a little bit easier for me to work on the boba hat. Um, and with the boba hat, um, it was a challenge for myself because uh, the Yuzu cowl was just one size only. Um, and I had wanted to try writing patterns for different sizes of people. And so the boba hat had um, a couple of different sizes. I forgot how many already, but I needed to learn how to um, adapt the pattern to fit um, different people and also understand like what is the standard sizing for hats and things like that. Um, 
And one other thing, uh, one other reason why I decided to um, publish the boba hat pattern uh, was because I felt like um, my culture wasn't that well presented in the knitting world. Um, I feel like getting bubble tea is such a normal thing in my community. Like it's just like um, going out for coffee with somebody, you go out to have bubble tea with somebody to catch up about life and everything. Um, and I had wanted to knit something with um, a bubble tea themed or something like that. And I just wasn't finding a lot of patterns on Ravelry on that. Um, Theme. So I wanted to um, share something from my culture through knitting um, by publishing the boba hat pattern. So that that's how it came about. Um, and also, I feel like um, knitting um, isn't very common in Taiwan. I find uh, I know when I was in Taiwan uh, working on the boba hat. Um, there was a lady who came by and then she was like what are you doing because she's never seen people knit before and i told her like i'm knitting a hat and she told me like oh we don't really see people do that anymore these days um so it's just interesting to learn that oh there are some places that where knitting is still not very common and is it because they're there isn't a lot of patterns that people like, or is it the weather? Is it too warm in Taiwan? And if so, um, should there be more warm weather clothing patterns or things like that? Just, um, yeah. That's a <laughs> good question. I wonder why too, because like my family is also from Taiwan. Yeah. And I remember when I was learning to knit when I was a kid, my grandma would always come up and tell me, she's like, why are you so busy? Why are you being so busy? Why are you always making things? Why are you always doing stuff? It was yeah. very funny. Like it was a very funny comment. Um, just like, why are you so busy? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I kind of get that from my husband too sometimes. Like, oh. like can you just sit and just be? But you can't. Right. Like, I, I want to be. I want to be doing something. Why would I just sit here when I could be knitting something? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm very happy to be able to share your boba hat with everyone because bubble tea is the best drink and yes. um <laughs> yeah and yeah. so I I do encourage everybody to give that a try yeah yeah absolutely and I think uh what people kind of misunderstand about bubble tea is that like people assume you always have to add the pearls but you really don't have to it's optional like it's okay to just get the tea if you want I find that some people can be intimidated by the pearls but you really don't have to have to get it. The pearls are the best part. I started putting pearls, <laughs> like just pearls on oatmeal, oh. pearls on other things. Now they bake like pearls into pancakes. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. So many good things uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> to discover. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I have last question for you because yeah. now it is the end of October. It's getting into November. Yeah. Um, and holiday season is coming. I always get to this point at the at every year and I always have these visions that I will make things for everyone that I know. Everyone in my family will get a handmade thing and then it never happens. <laughs> <laughs> and then I get really frustrated and disappointed with myself. How do you approach um, this whole sort of moving toward holiday season and the possible impending pressure of making things for the holidays. So how do you, how do you sort of, what's your mindset around all of this? Oh, okay. I, I, uh, I try not to force myself to do it. Um, I think I, I've never really done any kind of holiday knitting, like lining up all the, the gifts for people. I think Charlotte does that and she's amazing at coming up with like a lot of knitted hats like in like a day or something uh, but for me like that's something I, I don't do and so I, I feel like I don't feel the pressure to do that um, uh, but I do have a couple of projects that I'm trying to finish um, at the end of this year so one of the things that I've wanted to try for a long time is um, uh, doing embroidery on knitted uh, knitted work and so I I want to make this hat for my daughter um, just a very simple knitted hat but I want to try uh, embroidering little flowers on it 
and see what that's like. Um, I, I will always see people do embroidery on their sweaters and it, it just looks so beautiful. Um, and that seems like something that could be interesting to try. So that's something I'm, I have working on. Um, and um, I also love, uh, I love working with uh, sock blanks. Um, so I have this project that I'm working on right now where I'm combining uh, one strand of a sock blank with a speckled yarn. And I'm, I'm making a, a, a cardigan out of the combo. And so the, the body of the cardigan is gonna be a bit of a gradient. Um, and this will be a cardigan for my daughter. So yeah, I'm uh, yeah, very enjoying this project right now. Um, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Just with like being able to unravel a sock blank and then re-knit it into something and watching the colors change and then yeah. also incorporating a speckled yarn into it. Yeah. It's just like every stitch is a surprise. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. And that's the excitement that I, I'm trying to hold on to. Yeah. The, the, the part that sparks joy for me is mm -hmm. seeing the colors change every row, every stitch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was really, really lovely to talk with you today, Athena, because um, it's been some time, I think, since I've been able to chat with you. And um, and I know that so many things have changed in your life and there's like going through evolution and lots of things. And I am so happy to hear how you've progressed through all of this and um and develop this mindset that feels very healthy. It feels very uh, much like you can make space for craft in your life without it making you um, feel pressure or unhappy, that you can still find joy in making, um, you know, despite having, you know, work and responsibilities and family and all of these kinds of things that you've managed to come through all of this in such a sort of a graceful way where you can still enjoy what you make and the making process. So it's very inspiring to hear you talk today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Felicia. So if people want to find you, people want to follow you, what is the best place where they can come and find you? Um, probably Instagram. So I'm on Instagram at athena.makes. Uh, and that's where you'll find all the different crafts I'm diving into at the moment. Fantastic. Wonderful. So everybody can go find Athena on Instagram, athena.makes, and you can see her punch needle photos and her quilting photos and her knitting photos. And yeah. it's just so many wonderful things. So thank you so much for being here today, Athena. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia.